Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, yes, we have a pop-up version of Lemons to Lemonade. We have a special guest tonight. LaTanya, please welcome our guest to our show. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being in the room. Come in the room. Welcome to a very special night, as Dana said. We just had to come on while we had Brother Simon uh, in the States to be able to come on and spend this time with us. And please tag, please share, please subscribe to our channel. Welcome, everyone. And welcome to our brother, Simon. He's in the studio with us. I'm so excited. I have heard about you from Dana at her last speaking engagement, and she just was so elated that you had time to come with us. I'm looking forward to a wonderful dialogue tonight for us to get to know you, for our viewers to get to know you, Brother Simon. And this is going to be amazing. I did put a song up, Dana. If you have time, I wouldn't mind going to a good song of praise. Brother Simon, we always begin our, our shows with some praise time, just to get us ready and set the atmosphere for a great time. So everybody just sit tight, sit back and relax. And I'm going to cue up a song and we're going to have a good time of praise. Do I have an opportunity to propose a song? Oh, well, go right ahead. Can I? Yes, sir. Okay, I, I love this. Uh, uh, it's uh, someone should help me with the name, but it's it's a new version of uh, uh, Whitney Houston and Mariah. When you believe, yes. Whitney Houston and Mariah. When you believe. Carrie? When you believe. When you, well, let me get that ready. Yes. When you believe. Well, give me just a moment. Uh, Dana, can you give me a moment to get that queued up? All right. I'm going to find it right now just for you, Brother Simon. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. While we're doing that, Brother Simon Senke, will you introduce yourself? Tell our followers who you are and what you do. Okay, to all people watching from all corners of the world, especially in the United States of America, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Simon Senkai, all the way from Uganda, uh, East Africa, that is the continent of Africa. So many people don't know that Africa is a continent. I come from Uganda, but right now I'm in the state of Massachusetts. I have some work here to do. I work with Inspiration and Insights Hub back home in Uganda. I'm an inspirational speaker, a life coach, and a business mentor. Uh, I'm also a media personality. I work with uh, various radio stations in my country and TV stations. Uh, I love sharing with people. I love working with people. I love listening to people's experiences. And I love enriching others with what I know, with what I have. Uh, for I believe uh, in our creed that I am because we are and because we are, therefore I am. So that defines who I am, that defines what I do, and that influences uh, my works. I believe that each of us, respective of where we are, we can add value on each other. We can, in the end, liberate ourselves through lots and lots of activities. So... Basically, I focus on inspiration. I'm an inspirational speaker. I'm a business and a life coach back home in Uganda. Excellent. Thank you so much for that great introduction. Awesome. And before we go into our song of the night, which was selected by our guest, I just want to say Section 107 of the Copyright Access, the Fair Use of a copyrighted work for purposes such as criticism, comment, news, reporting, teaching, scholarship, or research is not an infringement of copyright. And any videos that we show um, that are not owned by them is to eliminate, we use them under the Fair Use Act, all right? I'm gonna go ahead and get our song queued up and we're gonna have a great time. One moment, everybody. Okay.
Thank you so much for that piece. It is Excellent. our pleasure. <laughs> I love it. When you believe somehow, somewhere, love miracle it. happen. Yeah. Love it. Powerful song. And it makes sense because it is aligned with your testimony and what you speak about um, yeah. as you impact people globally and how you encourage people to understand the power of small beginning and believing in yourself. So that song, it makes perfect sense that you would select that song. And that's a good, a good mantra to live by. A yeah. good way to encourage not only yourself, but other people. So thank you for that. I needed to hear that for myself. Because sometimes we get a little by down with the hustle and bustle of life. And we don't realize, you know, you've got dreams too. And you deserve to live out your dreams as well as others are watching. So thank you for that suggestion, Brother Simon. You're welcome. Excellent. So let's get right into the show for the night. I'm hearing a little bit of echo. So if when each of us is speaking, if the other one can have their line on mute, maybe that can cut down on a little bit of the echo. Brother Simon and I met in July. We were both speakers at the Global Youth Network event which was held at a beautiful convention center in Irving, Texas, in my home state. And we have kept in touch. And Brother Simon was such a powerful speaker. I tell you, the old church lady came out in me and I had to stand to my feet and wave my hands as a tendency. So we are dated to Thanks everybody, hang in there with us. So Brother Simon, I wanted to, um, first of all, thank you again for being here and for taking out time from your business trip uh, to spend with Dana and I. It is a pleasure uh, to meet uh, you, even virtually, hopefully someday I'll get to meet you in person. Uh, but I wanted to talk to you and ask a quick question, if you don't mind, about the pillars of success that you did a video about a few years ago. And particularly you gave uh, homage to your mom. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I'm back. Yes. <laughs> mm, okay, I'm back. <laughs> okay, I was mm. asking a question. I, I saw your video that you made about the pillars of success and you mentioned, uh, I believe it's five of them. There's yeah, six. Mistaken. There's six, thank you. Can't forget about prayer. <laughs> I would want to know if you can, if, if you don't mind, go over them for our viewers, because we talk a lot on this show about um, business. Yeah. We talk about uh, prayer. We talk about having a strong spiritual base. Yeah. We talk about community. And just like uh, Dana's company, the Campus of Care Global Healthcare Corporation is based on pillars. I was especially intrigued that you have uh, your own sticks that you believe in. And would you mind sharing those with our listeners and viewers this evening? Okay, I'm glad. I'm glad once again to be here. Thank you. Yeah, uh, over time, uh, from my personal experiences, what I've gone through and learning from those uh, that came before me, you know, one person said, if I have seen Father, it's because I stood on the shoulders of the giants. So 
reflecting on those that came before me, some are personal challenges of life, or growing up and becoming who I am today and being able to do what I do. Uh, I've focused a lot on so many things, but summarize them in these pillars of success. First and foremost, uh, whenever we talk about success, uh, people think uh, they have their own definitions of success. When someone maybe uh, accomplishes maybe a course, that is success to them. Others, when they get something to eat uh, in a day, that is success to them. Others, when they just uh, when they just get somewhere to put their head, like a roof on their on on their head, that is success. So people define success basing on their personal aspirations, where they come from, and the dynamics surrounding their lives. But to me. Uh, as a spiritual person, I'm not so religious, but I'm very spiritual. So as a spiritual person, I believe that I'm in this body right now to fulfill a mission. Uh, I wasn't, uh, it wasn't an accident that my mother conceived me. She conceived me for a purpose. And my ability to identify this mission of why I came and my ability to walk towards that mission, accomplishing that mission or doing something about that mission, to me, that defines my success. My success is not in how much I have accumulated on my, in my accounts. My success isn't about uh, the things that people can see with their physical eyes. My success is defined by my, the distance between who I am and what I came here to do and how far I have moved. So to me, that is success. That is why when I was talking about the pillars of success, uh, I focus so much on those intrinsic things that define a person, that define us in this life. We didn't come here to accumulate a lot of money. We didn't come here to make a lot of money to enrich ourselves with the pleasures of life. Yes, that's an, ad that's an advantage. If you're able to do that, that's an advantage. You need it to, to do so many things in your life. But whatever we achieve materially is supposed to help us propel uh, our actions and our impact that uh, manifests our mission, our purpose here on earth. So the first principle uh, was the principle of purpose. The first principle. Uh, I'm using my mobile phone right now. The person who manufactured, who produced this phone, intentionally wanted us to communicate using this tool. So the purpose of this phone, or the purpose of my computer, is to enable me to do my work. So if my phone has a purpose, even I, I do have a purpose in this body. It's not an accident that I live. So the most important thing in life is one to ask themselves, what am I here for? Why do I exist? Why am I still alive? Because as you're speaking right now, there's so many breathing their last. So many people dying all over the world. They're, they're breathing their last. So you and I that are blessed with that gift of breath, why are we still breathing? Is there something beyond money? Is there something beyond enriching ourselves materially? Is there something beyond happiness, being happy, enjoying life? There is something that we came here to do, and that is our purpose. Fortunately or unfortunately, our purpose is not for us. It's for other people. The divine concept of success sits on a premise that one must give what they have in order to get what they want. So for you to become what you want to become, you must be willing to offer what you have. But we've turned that around in the world of today. The people, the number of people who want to get without giving is increasing every day. People want to take, but they're not giving anything. Yet in greatness or in success, you have to first give what you have in order to receive 
what you may need. Whatever we need is not with us, it is with other people. If I'm able to give out what I have to the world, the world, in appreciation of what I offer, they might give me back what I may need. So the most important thing is identifying why you exist. That is purpose. Purpose is why your vision is. Purpose is the, the compass of your life. You wake up every day. You know who to talk to. You know what to do. You know where to go. You know how to do what you have to do. Because you know who you are and what you came here for. You know, that is purpose. And the moment one finds that sole purpose as to why they exist, they go to the next pillar. That is the principle of passion. You cannot have genuine passion until you find your purpose. I can speak for 10 hours without resting. I can talk, I can speak to anyone, anywhere for all the time without getting tired because I have passion for that. But that passion came as a result of me understanding my purpose. When I found my purpose, passion was born. So I hear so many people talking about find your passion. Passion sits in your purpose. When you find your purpose, no one has to wake you up. You don't need anyone to force you to do something. You don't need anyone to call you to remind you. You remind yourself. And in fact, you even forget that you, you haven't ate anything. You don't feel angry. You don't feel thirsty. You, you do what you do because you love it. Our satisfaction in life is derived from our passion, and passion sits in our purpose. Whenever we do what we have to do, what we love doing, we are fulfilled. That is the manifestation of God's glory. That is the manifestation of your glory as a person. For every person that is living right now has glory in them. And that glory in them is divine. Their purpose, their role is to manifest that glory. When that glory is manifested, becomes the light to those that are in the darkness of ignorance. So the most important thing is know why you exist. When you find that which fulfills your life, you're automatically going to have the passion of doing it. The moment you get that passion, you need to understand the third pillar. That is planning. You need to have a plan. One man said that if you fail to plan, then you're planning to fail. There are so many talented people around the world that are living an average life. That are too average, that their lives do not have any way they're touching other people's lives. It doesn't mean that they don't, they're not talented. They are talented. They are passionate at what they do, but they, you need to have a plan. How are you going to do it? When I found my purpose that I love transforming other people's lives through mentorship and inspirational speaking, I knew that I had to find ways. I, I needed to have a plan. And that plan right now has brought me in Boston. Last time I met Professor, Professor Dana, we were in Texas. It was because of that plan. So I realized I had to find radio stations in my country to, to give out this because whatever I have is not for me, it's for other people. If I don't have a plan of giving it out, of taking it to the owners, I'm not going to, they're not going to see me. They're not going to feel my presence. The, my impact is not going to be there. So you need to have a plan. How do you intend to move? Yes, you know who you are. You have the passion for it. Now, what do you need to do? You need to do something. In, you know, so many people believe in miracles. I believe in miracles. But I believe that even if miracles are there, you need to be prepared. You need a human action. In a miracle, there are two components. There is a component of the spirit and there is a component of the human. There is a physical part and the spiritual part. So a miracle is there, but even the, spiritual, the, the physical principles must be in play. It is, it is unfortunate for people who spend like they can spend uh, most of their time in church praying. You know, praying and praying, things are not going to make themselves because prayer isn't in 
our success equation, praise in the revelation equation. When you pray, you get a revelation of what you need to do, the journey that you need to walk. But God is not going to walk for you. You must have a plan on how you're going to walk that journey that has been manifested to you, you know? So that is planning. But you cannot plan alone. So if you have your purpose, your passion, and the planner side, you need to have people. That is the fourth principle. Your network determines your net worth. We understand that the world has changed so much that it is no longer about what you know alone, but who you know. Who you know is very important. Right now, the opportunity that you're praying for is going to come through another person. Right now, the blessing that I'm praying for or working hard for must come through another person. So you need people. You need people of the right mindset. You need people that can support you. You need people that can enrich you, that can carry you, that can hold your hand, that can show you a, a path that you're supposed to take. We need people to succeed in life. But this is the other side of it. To succeed, you need to lose some people. For even if you need people, to succeed, you need to lose some people. All people are good, but not all are right for your success. All Prince, people Prince. are good, but not all people are right for you. So there are lots of good people outside there. Leave them there if they are not right for your purpose. So identify only those people that align so well with who you are and what you want. And in the end, you'll be lifted to the steps that you need to be taken to. But for anyone to hold your hand, you must work hard to put yourself at a level where someone can hold your hand. People are not going to find you wherever you are, where you're hidden, where you're hiding from, where you are, and they pick you from there. When you know your purpose, you know your passion, you have the plan, you begin to walk. You begin to work. You put yourself at work. You start doing what you have to do so that you lift yourself to a level where those that you need to see, you can see you. That is the reason why I'm with Professor Dana. We met. We had to meet. You know, you have to position yourself strategically to be seen, to be identified, so that the world can get to know that you do exist. When they get to know that you do exist, then the right people that God positioned for you are going to identify you. Because a tree doesn't look for people to eat the fruit. Its role is to produce the fruit. Whoever is in need of a particular fruit will always create a way to the tree that has the right fruit. So we need to bear the fruit. We need to do the work. We need to put in the work and do what we have to do so that the right people come. When the right people come, God said in, in scriptures, they say, uh, seek, you shall find. Knock, it shall be opened unto you. Ask, it shall be given unto you. But even if they promised us that when you knock, it shall be opened unto you, they didn't mention how many times you're supposed to knock. Yes. So you're supposed to yes. keep on knocking and knocking and knocking until the door opens. You're supposed to keep on praying and praying and praying. You're supposed to wake up every day to look for what you want. That is the fifth principle, persistence. Yes. Success is for those that are willing to move even when the odds are against the movement. You have to keep on moving. Whenever you find yourself abandoning what you started because of circumstances, that means it was never your purpose. You can never give up on your purpose. When one door is closed, you look for another. When one road is closed, you take another route. Destination doesn't change, but the route can change. But the destination cannot change. So whenever you find uh, yourself changing the destination, it means you are never in your purpose. I can never give up. No one can frustrate me. I'll keep on talking to other people. I'll keep on mentoring other people. I'll keep on speaking to other people until 
that door will be opened. That is persistence. You must be persistent in the first year, in the second year, in the third year, in the fourth year, in the fifth year, until the right time the door will open. In China, there is a bamboo tree. Uh -huh. When you plant the seed, you have to water the ground the first year. The seed doesn't sprout. You water the ground the second year. You water the ground the third year, the fourth year. On, at the end of the fifth year, the seed brings out the hay. When it comes out from the ground after five years, it takes six weeks for that tree to grow 90 feet tall. Imagine, one can ask, how long does it take? It, take? it takes five years to grow. But you must be persistent. You must be patient. Persistence is synonymous with patience. Patience comes from faith. Faith is derived from understanding that whatever you're doing is you. You don't have anything else. You don't have an alternative. That is you. Whenever you know that you have no choice, but you have to do it, you'll be patient. You'll have the faith for it. And lastly, after the, 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 the fifth principle, which is persistence, we go to the sixth principle, that is prayer. Prayer. Prayer won't help you to succeed, but prayer rejuvenates a weakened soul. Prayer gives us the revelation of the journey. Sometimes we get tired. Sometimes we get disappointed and frustrated. Sometimes we are human. There are moments that are going to be dark. There are times you're not going to be you. We are human. There is no vaccine for problems. Even when you pray from morning to morning, problems will come. In fact, the price you pay is equivalent to the magnitude of the dream you're pursuing. If the dream is huge, the price you pay is huge. Hey. So you must be willing to go through pain, to go to make some sacrifices. You, you're going to find people that will disappoint you, will frustrate you. You're going to find people that are going to try to put you off on the track. You have to keep on moving. Why? Because whatever you're doing is not for you. It is for he who put that spirit in your body. But if whatever you're doing is yours, God is going to stand with you through thick and thin and eventually you will win. So prayer is like a few is like fuel for our vehicles. Our bodies are the vehicles. Our souls in our bodies sometimes they get tired. When we get tired, we need to re to rejuvenate. We need that moment, and through prayer, our spirits are rejuvenated. So, in summary, when you know thy purpose, when you know thy purpose. Passion is going to be automatic. But even if passion is automatic, you must have a plan for your passion. And when you have the plan, you need to identify the right people that can help you along the way. When you're working with people, things are not going to happen in a day, in a night. It might take weeks, it might take months, it might even take years. So you need to be persistent. But through persistence, as you persist, you need to be praying. You need to be rejuvenating yourself every day. You know, he said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness shall be added unto you. The kingdom, the kingdom is our purpose. When you find that purpose and you become a master of that purpose, you become a king in that purpose. Trust me, you become a king people are going to serve you. That is why we say, when you find yourself, the world will find you. When you find yourself, the world will find you. You don't have to fight people. You don't have to struggle to be seen, to be found. No, find yourself and concentrate on building that which you have found. Work on it every day, every night. Work on it during rain and during sunshine. 
Work on it when you're tired, when you're strengthened. Work on it every day until that door will open. Those are the pillars that I shared with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Brother Simon. I, I tried to warn them to let them know that you were just such a breath of fresh air and you in your spirit and in your soul, you're twice or three times your age. You have wisdom far beyond you. your years. Thanks um, be to God. We were just chatting here in the chat and I want to say that our grandparents and great grandparents, my would they not have loved to have been able to chat across the big pond with our brothers and sisters. So we take this opportunity every time that we can to connect, to show that your struggles are our struggles. Thank you. Your allies are our allies. And many times your enemy, your open enemy, who is constantly declaring themselves as your enemy. There are enemies too. And we're just grateful to have you here. We want to bring you on to our states where we are in Michigan and Texas and Pennsylvania. And right now this week at my historically black college, there are lectures going on and we want to be able to bring you so that everyone here can enjoy you the way that we are enjoying you. And this is how we get the work done is through each other. One person has the provision, the other person has the need. It's that marriage of yeah. the one who has the desire and the one who has the resources. We've been kept apart so long. Our focus is bringing our people together across religious lines, across tribal lines, across party yeah. lines. That's, that's the way we worked when we were taken from our homeland, when we were put on ships. We always found a way to work together. Yeah. So thank you again. Uh, tell me how, how long you'll be in the States this time. I'm here for a week, a weekend, a week and some three days. Okay. Yeah, because remember I was here for a month. So yes. I'd come specifically for this event and it's done. So um, on Saturday, I'll be traveling back. Okay, great. But I'm open to coming back anytime, whenever yes. we we are ready. So I'm open to traveling and sharing with different people. Excellent. Yeah. Latanya, did you have any thoughts or any uh, questions for Brother Simon Senkai? First of all, thank you. This really was divinely orchestrated, Brother Simon. First of all, how you and, and Dr. Dana met, that was a divine uh, moment. Yeah. And then here you are on the Limits to Eliminate podcast and everything you were saying um, lines up with what Dana and I talk about, she has the social entrepreneur initiative program and she talks about, okay, you have that great idea. So now what, how do we get you in position for success? The planning you talked about, the people in place. So everything that you have, all six pillars uh, fall right <laughs> in line. I, I was just feverishly writing my notes. Like I needed to hear. And we have our, our sister author, Joy Simone, has been having a praise party in the comments and I should have had my tambourine or some symbols yes. or something because this has been a spiritual awakening uh, for me. Many of us have been sitting on our dreams, sitting on the things that God has planted in our spirit. And you mentioned that thing is coming in your mind over and over and you just can't shake it. It's probably your passion. Yeah, knocking at the door like it's raining out here. Will you let me in? Don't be yeah. afraid. You may not have the resources now, yeah. but you get the people in place and you know your purpose and you got a plan and you're praying. It's going to come together. You have encouraged my entire spirit and soul tonight. And I really hope everyone shares this because there's some people who need this message of hope. You bring a message of hope and faith uh, to us globally. As, as a matter of fact, when God calls on us to serve, he doesn't look at uh, um, our physical capacity. He looks at our spiritual capacity. And how do you get to know that the dream that you have is divine? Whenever you have something that you need to do, 
But when you look at yourself, you don't have what it takes physically to do it. That is an indication that whatever you're carrying is divine. For, for God looks at your spirit, the ability of your spirit, the blessings of your spirit, not your body, not your physical capacity. So if you want to test the power of the spirit, that is why if the, the scriptures say if you have faith as a leader, as a mustard seed, you shall tell a mountain to move from here to there and yes. nothing shall be impossible for you. So when you take the first step in faith, when you take that first action in faith, that is when you get to understand the power of your spirit. Don't look at how much you have on that count. Don't look at how many people around you can support you. Look at how much faith do you have to take that first leap of faith. That is the first action. When you take it, doors will open, not because of your power, but because of that faith, that action of faith that you've taken towards your purpose. For when it calls on you, into that line, into that path, is ready to move with you, but only when you take the first step. Powerful, powerful. And it puts perspective on those of us who suffer with physical ailments. If that's not what God is looking at, then that means he can still use us. Yeah. Even with what we are experiencing every day, our purpose is still intact. God has been looking at what you can't do, how you can't move, what you feel like. This yeah. is a faith journey. You are a walking tent revival minus the tent because you, yeah. you just set my soul on fire. Um, um, Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Did you have any uh, questions for us? We're here on Thursday nights, oh, and yeah, as yeah. I had uh, said to you, that's middle of the night for you when we come on. So it's just such a treat, and we certainly did not mind coming on a special night and bringing you here. I believe uh, I believe we can have uh, more sessions. Maybe we can record pre-record them, Ali, uh, depending yeah. on our. Uh, on our time back home, we can pre-record them and after they can be broadcasted. I think, uh, I don't know, because some of these things need to be consistent. We talked about persistent, but we need to be consistent with whatever we're doing because you don't know what, uh, who these experiences will, will, will touch, will change. So many people are going through lots of challenges. Uh, they have lots of questions. Sometimes when we meet here to share, someone you don't know might might be there and they're waiting for this answer and you have the answer. So I believe we can be consistent and pre-record in order to, to fit in the time because uh, yes. I, I remember last time I missed because wh when I was home, your time, it was like 2 a.m. in the morning in my country, but it was 8 uh, p.m. where you were. So sometimes... There's a mismatch when it comes to time. But I believe we can always do a, have a plan and continue teaching our people. Excellent. Yeah. That's a great idea, uh, Dana. I'm, I'm hoping that we can do that soon because we certainly have that capability. And this message is so powerful. Yes. So very powerful. Absolutely. This has been amazing. Thank you to everybody in the comments. You all have been having a great time. We're so thankful to have you with us on this special night on this uh, evening's Monday evening uh, to come on and bring this special guest. We just had to make sure we grabbed him uh, while he was within the United States That's and on right. one, of our, one of our time zones. So we had to take advantage. And I have been so, so, so blessed. This is just absolutely just wonderful to spend this time with Brother Simon. Thank you. Yes, sir. Right. We you have, might uh, have some questions, Dana. I, I didn't have any questions. I just wanted you guys to see and hear and experience the um, powerful speaker that I experienced. I And talk about divine meeting. I was not even supposed to be there. I was out of state and we were sending another speaker and then they couldn't come at the last minute and I 
ended up coming, which was the original plan. So I know that it was divine for us to meet. And there is so much that we can do through Zoom, through StreamYard yeah. with yeah. helping. Because here's, here's the deal. What I say all the time is those of us who have been born and raised here on these shores we know that everybody in the world wants to come to America because it is presented as the land of opportunity. But those of us who were born here, whether we wanted to be born here or not, our great grandparents and great great grandparents who were brought here by force and built this place. So many of these opportunities that are posed to people from abroad are not posed to our people here. And the frustration that our people experience, I'm old enough to remember the 60s and the 70s and the drugs being flooded into the black community. So our social entrepreneurs initiative shows our people here where to get the funding to open a corner store. You'll have people that come from every corner of the earth come into the black community because they are told black people spend 1.2 trillion dollars every year. Come on in here and make your bed out there in the suburbs, but come in every day and make your money here. I think about the 1980s when a black girl was shot by a, an Asian shop owner. They accused her of stealing some hair or something and the person did not do any jail time. So these are some of the issues that we're fighting. In my own research, it's all focused on the social determinants of health. And I'll give you a statistic about Black women dying between 800 and 1,200 every year, either on the delivery table or up to one year after. And if your sister or your cousin comes here, the first generation, she may be okay, but her daughter and her grandmother and daughter after the second generation fall victim to that same issue. And from our studies in public health, we found that it is the toxic stress of going to work every day, of having a boss that treats marginalized people in a way that is less than humane, or we call them microaggressions every day, all day. What's happening is your stress hormones like cortisol, adrenaline, and norepinephrine are constantly coursing through your bloodstream and you end up with hypertension, anxiety. So these are some of the things that Africans in America, as Marcus Garvey calls us, that we are dealing with. And then we have poverty and we have a lack of access to resources everywhere else. So if we marry each other, if we come together and say, at all costs, we're going to work together. I don't care if you're Fulani, this one's Wolof. We don't care about that. It is my personal mission to make sure that we tear down all the walls. Uh, here in America, it looks like religious denominations. Oh, I can't talk to them because they're Baptists. And over here, I belong to this denomination. If we are busy being divided and conquered, none of us will reach our full potential. What are your thoughts on that? The first, uh, the first step uh, that our opponents took, they knew that moving together would be a, very, a great hindrance for them to fulfill what they wanted. So they had to separate us. They had to dissect us into small manageable groups. Yes. The first step they used to me, I believe they used religion. They found Africans, they were working together. They believed in a community. They could sit and discuss and agree about things that are benefiting their communities. So these people were one. Whenever they decided to do something, they did it as one, as one people. That is why, actually that is where our creed comes from that I am because we are, and because we are, therefore I am. So working together as Africans was an obstacle to the fulfillment of our opponent's mission. So what they did was to dissect us into groups that they could manage. So they dissected us into Catholics, uh, Protestants, Adventists, 
others Muslims. So it was very hard after then for men in Africa to come together and agree on certain things. So whenever they discussed about something, then the minority principle would come in. Have you seen? We, the Muslims, have been left behind. Now, we, the Catholics, they have not been, we have, we've not been considered. We, the Anglicans. So they use that card for quite long to date, respective of how empowered we are and how exposed we are. We still hate each other because we don't go to the same church. We don't worship the same way. You know, that alone has helped a lot of people achieve their missions simply because we can no longer come together. Then the second one was education. You know, I will give you an example. Before the Europeans came to my country, they found us with an established kingdom, with a government from local council one to local council five. They found our social structure well defined. We were living, we were putting on clothes because we were producing clothes from a back, a back of the tree, back of the Mutuba tree. We call it a back growth. Today, that back growth, Nike, the company of Nike has taken it over. Uh, Baines, Mercedes Benz, uh, uh, they have taken it over, you know? So the, the, they found us well organized. So what they did was to tell us that their education was more important than our education that we had. What they do, for instance, in Africa, we have young people that go to university and they maybe pursue a degree in mechanical engineering. After four years, they graduate as mechanical engineers. But the unfortunate bit of it is they can only work on the vehicles their masters have produced. They are not trained to produce their own vehicles, to develop their own vehicles. They are trained to work on those that have been produced for them. It means they didn't give them education. They didn't give us education. They simply took away what we had, offered to us what we, what we thought was good, but it was empty indeed. There is nothing in it. However, for many years, they left. But the problem still exists. How? They control the funding. They control the funding. If we are going to give you money in your Ministry of Education, we need you to follow this curriculum, a curriculum that is not designed for your people, but is designed for their great-great-grandchildren, for, for us to continue believing that hope is in their countries. I believe there are many opportunities in the United States. But let me be honest with you. There are thousands and millions of opportunities in Africa. Take an example of uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. One man gave an assumption that when you combine the wealth on the surface of the United States, the wealth on the surface of the United States, and you combine it together, not beneath, but on the surface of the United States, and you combine it together, it cannot make 50% of the wealth that is beneath Congo. That's right. Just one country. Cannot, yeah, just one country. Just, just one country. But, but look at Congo. Children are dying of hunger. They're dying of disease. They're fighting each other. Who gives them machines? The enemy, you know? So the mindset of our people was put in a cage. People, so, you know, our role right now is to empower our people so much to the extent that they are able to think for themselves, to act, leading themselves. A lot yeah. of people are, are still yeah. in the prison of their minds, that they believe in certain things that are not going to add value on them. That is why Africa is losing its human resource every day. Thousands and th thousands of young people are running away from Africa. Between the age of 18 and 30, those are, that is the prime time, that is the prime age one can benefit the nation. And they, are still, they are still flocking Europe. 
they're working yes. for those mm -hmm. continents yeah. and Africa is left behind and these people after they leave after we leave they come back to take over in the next and 50 years they're going to take over it works everywhere. It works in Africa. It works in America, in our inner cities. They say, oh, you don't want to live over there. That's terrible. They go and all of our great, great grandmothers that have properties. See, we do, even when the television was designed, before the television was designed, we were happy and content. The one thing that television did was it showed you how someone else was living and it made you say, oh, I want to have that. So then you go out and you work, 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 work. Work your fingers to the bone. When I was a little girl, there were grandmothers who never made 50,000, 100,000, $200,000 like many of us do today, but they died and they left maybe $15,000 in camp. Their house was paid for. Today, our people are dying with no burial policy. They're doing a GoFundMe. So we have more resources and we do much less than our ancestors did. Let me tell you another way that this works with the divide and conquer. On this broadcast, we talk a lot about Dr. Francis Cress Welsing, one of our ancestors. And she made transition, I believe, in 2016. Black psychiatrist, her father was a physician, her grandfather was a physician from Washington, D.C. And Dr. Welsing says that racism, and I call it the phony white supremacy, because saying white supremacy defies science. We know that whiteness, the condition of whiteness, is a genetic mutation and it is recessive. So Dr. Welsing says that racism is a mental illness and all other mental illnesses stem from that. Her research basically opened the door for us to be able to understand exactly what we were dealing with. And in the 60s, they were telling black people, oh, don't listen to Malcolm X, he's not telling you the right thing. So you had this whole generation of people who didn't work together as you have stated because of this divide and conquer, but now we know. And now we have all the resources and what will we do with it? Exactly what we're doing tonight. And not just talking, not just getting on the air and restating the problem, but here on this broadcast, we are about solutions. That's why we went to work with Sylvia to help her with her work here and vice versa. I've known since the age of eight that I wanted to retire in Africa when I learned in 1974 about the Tuskegee experiment. And when people come to this country and they are blown away to find out that the US government sponsored a program to watch black men walk around with syphilis, a sexually transmitted infection for 40 years, just to see how bad it would get. This is the kind of demonic force that we have been dealing with on these shores. So now that we know and we're traveling back and forth to the motherland, I have several colleagues from Philadelphia who travel back and forth to Ghana and Senegal and we support work there. This is what we are supposed to be doing, is uniting, working together across the aisle. Latanya. That's Would you great. like to get in there? This is amazing. I'm just elated at uh, this discussion and how powerful um, this message has been tonight. And in listening to our brother Simon and how everything is lining up in divine order in what we've been saying. I'm so glad that we've had this conversation tonight. And ever since I've met you, Dana, you mentioned to us that you are Pan-African and it was a new concept to me, but I learn more and more each week why you say that and why you chose that way of life, uh, because we are all one, even across uh, the waters. And I thank you for being consistent with that message and never backing down from that message, uh, because what affects one, it affects us all. And yeah. this this conversation tonight, it just really um, solidifies what we've been discussing 
and how we can do something and how we can help people. And what you said was so important. And it made me think, how in the world did our ancestors and our grandmothers, great grandmothers do so much with so little, but here we are with so much and have what to do, limitless access to all types of resources that they would have never heard of in their time would have never dreamed of if you had told them they would have called you crazy you're talking about what social what that doesn't make any sense but look at where we are but we still haven't gotten it right in terms of priority why are we spending millions on every pair of new gym shoes but when we die we are begging the community to help us put our loved one in the ground with some type of integrity why when we get our our tax our income taxes we're going to get the biggest the tv is bigger than the house the tv is bigger than the home put the address on the tv because the tv is bigger than the home that we live in because we're trying to compete with one another. When we shift our focus about money, our focus on spirituality and start to unite across denominations, across religions, do you know how more effective we will be as a people? My parents would never let me say the words Malcolm X in our home without an open hand and smacking them out. Less known, be able to listen to an entire video. But that's sad. We were so close. The religion divided us for generations. But I'm telling you, for me and mine, it stops with me. It stops with me. And when I met uh, Dana, she has opened me up, Brother Simon, to learning so much. Um, just there are scientists researchers, psychiatrists, doctors who look like me that Men people don't even know existed. Why? They will never be projected. We've got to make sure the word gets out. Yeah. And, and, and we, I got to take it back to the beginning. We were thinkers when other people were still trying to get it together. They were trying to come up out of the cave. In the 700s, Black women were practicing birth control on the continent of Africa. Our history did not begin at the slave ship. That's another thing that we bought into that is a blatant no. distortion of truth. Yeah. So when we get back to that principle and start to teach our children, we've always been scientists. We developed science and mathematics. So don't be shocked when you see one who looks like you. We have to work around and overcome this. Uh, I don't call us minorities. When you, the one thing about the Pan-African political concept and that school of thought is that you don't separate yourself from the 90% of the world that is of color. I'm not a minority. Uh, how do we break the pathology, uh, et cetera, with author Joy Simone says, we're breaking it tonight. It's broken, done, no more. I yeah. often say 50 years from now, if the Lord allows this planet to live, somebody will still be talking about how to work through and get past the ridiculous and phony white supremacy. They'll run across this video and they'll say, you know, there were some people back in 2023 who had it together. Everybody wasn't brainwashed. We break the pathology yeah. by working together, by going to each other's churches, by going to each other's homes. When people say, oh, I want to be multicultural and I want to get along and I want to integrate with everybody. I understand now as an adult why Malcolm X said, get along with yourself. See, I naively thought that we were all a monolith at some point. When we were on the slave ship, we were not all from the same ethnic group or nation. No. We have always no. worked together. That's why no. unity, we can be uniform, we can be unified rather without being uniform. Latanya and I like accessories. Somebody else just likes a plain blouse and a plain shirt, but at the red light, yeah. when the race soldier stops you, we all look alike. We had better learn how to break this pathology more and more each day. I personally thought COVID did a great thing for black people yes. all around the world. Yeah. Yes, because we all had a chance to sit still at one time and look. What is that? Joyce Simone has a comment. 
I find it amazing how people have to continually point out that Africa is a continent, not a country. Well, and you know what, Let, let's, I don't think that's deliberate either. Look at the map. What do they call the people who make maps? Cartographers, I believe. Cartographers. Look at how the cartographers took Africa. It looks like maybe you can fit America into Africa twice or three times. You can actually yeah. fit America into Africa about six times and you still have some Africa left. There are. Multiple. Yes, that is true. That is true. That's true. That, uh, yes. I was married to a brother from South Africa for 28 years. The rule in our house was you have to know geography. Yeah. You must know world events. You can't walk around with your head in the sand. You know, I, I, I can take it back to East Texas, back to growing up. Some people that said, you know, all I know is that Jesus saved my soul. And yes, we're glad that Jesus died for us. <laughs> yeah. We have to know some other things too. Yeah. It's okay to have Jesus and a therapist. We've come through tons of trauma and are continually coming through trauma every day. The men in America, it is, this is our own national epidemic, black women dying in childbirth. If they wanted us to understand God, if they wanted us to have, like, if they wanted us to understand other things the way they wanted us to understand God, they would have allowed us to translate what is taught in our mother tongues. They allowed us to translate the Bible in all tongues around the, the world, but they didn't allow us to translate what is taught in school in our mother tongues. Now I'm asking myself, how come that I was so loved to an extent that they wanted me to understand God and then I don't have an understanding of science, how things <laughs> work, you know? Now, there is something that we need to question and understand, that you can't be praying. That is why for us in Africa, Africans are praying from morning to morning. But it's not just about prayer. You must understand how things work. Because even if you pray and you don't know how things work, someone else who understands how things work is going to come, take your minerals, and bring them back to you in, in, form, in form of expensive products. Gold, gold is taken away from Africa and they bring back coated watches of gold and they sell them expensively. So like this person has said, knowledge is power. Information brings transfer. Okay, information brings transformation, but we need to train our people to immerse themselves in that information so that they can be changed. So I think this is the right path to take, to have these discussions and share with our people to see that they are reawakened, to see some of these things. We had everything and we still have everything. When you read, when you read, about, when you read about black inventors, you get shocked. You get shocked that most of the great innovations in the world came from black people, came from slaves, mm -hmm. you know? But this history is not taught. I'm, I'm just wondering why. We cannot design our education. We cannot do anything for ourselves. The moment you allow another person to write your story, be ready to move around with an average book. We've allowed other people to define who we are. So we, are, we have to be yes. average. Yeah. You know, that's something... Um was just in Georgia at uh, Selman Morehouse, kind. that's two of our largest yeah, black colleges, and I was home of one of my mates. Right when you open the door, you swing the door to the right side, there's a huge um, map laminated that you pay $350 for from the ceiling down to the floor of Africa. She's she reminded me of our professor at Temple University, Dr. Malefe Keita Asante, the director of the African Studies Department. He actually signed that department in 1984. He said, first day of class, name five sub-Saharan countries of the 52 countries that were in Africa. Now two of them have been split, so now 54. And maybe me and one other person can name five countries that are south 
sub meaning under the Sahara Desert. And he said, see, that's why you need this class. He said, in this class, I'm going to teach you about yourself because you don't know anything about yourself. Temple University, it's almost impossible to graduate from there or even attend for a year and not know about yourself. People mistakenly think that Temple is one of the historically black colleges, but it is a predominantly white institution. In any event, my sorority sister said, I needed my children to know the motherland. She did Ancestry.com, found out exactly where they were from and were able to point to the children, okay? This is these are the kinds of ways that we break this pathology. Get a map of the motherland and have it in your house. I remember being in the seventh grade right before Roots came out and our children, black children like you and me, would laugh and say, ha, 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 he's from Africa because we had been brainwashed in slavery and told yes. everything from Africa was negative and nasty. And I said, well, I tell you what. They, they, they project Africa. Africa. They project Africa as hell. They divided Africa. Uh, let me be honest with you. I, inter I, I often interact with my brothers from South Africa. Sometimes I've come across some men who believe they're not part of Africa. I want you to imagine. Just like Egypt. Just like Egypt. Yes. And, and, and when you go back to ancient, ancient history and you read about Kemet before it became Egypt, Egypt means the land of black people. And when you try to read up, to, to do a research about the origin of the people that lived in Kemet, they will tell you that they moved from the source of the Nile, they were moving around the Nile to Kemet. All this history is hidden, is kept away from people. You know, they have brainwashed us to the extent that when I travel to America and a, a child that has been born here black, they don't look at me as part of them. You know, that is, brainwashing they look at me as someone from africa for you know from africa this is something that we need to change but thankfully when alex haley did the movie roots even though there were some problems with the book and all of that we've discussed that on the show there was some uh plagiarism that happened were it not for <laughs> alex haley many of our people and as i said i was in the seventh grade many of our people would not know about us being from Africa because our grandparents yes. and great grandparents were taught. There is an author who writes a book um, and I'll have to pull it from my shelf. It's, he says that we had a three second rule that we had to comply or die. When you get off that slave ship and I've studied plantation politics as a means of understanding the medical trauma that we've gone through. And think about it. Don't speak that language. A whip, they called it a cat of nine tails, broke nine pieces of leather braided together. So then you come onto the plantation. First of all, they would take you, we talked about this last Thursday, so pardon the repeat. They would send you down to Jamaica first to these farms that they call buck breaking farms. And what they wanna do is they wanna say, well, those were your own people that sold you. Well, they were tricked. They would trade us for some red beads or some gunpowder. And even in biblical times, when people were warring and you lost a war, you had to serve the person that you lost the war to, that country. But yeah. our brothers and sisters did not know the hell that existed on the other side of the Atlantic. I give you a story. Some of the chiefs in the village, they would get them drunk with alcohol, yeah. what they call fire water. And they say, oh, come on over here. We walk up the plank, sir peek in there and let me show you how many of your people we captured. And they would take their boot and kick him in the rear end and lock the doors. And now he was captive with the very people that he sold. You'd better study your history. Malcolm X said, if you know it, you'll be doomed. You won't be doomed to repeat it. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. We have a lot of work to do. This is the work. This is this is the fact that we're even talking to each other. The fact that yeah. I'm gonna tell you when I got married, I paid a dollar and sixty-seven cents to talk to my in-laws. Now we can talk to each other for free on all these apps. WhatsApp, yeah. Messenger. I talk to my people every day. Text them every day. Sisters and that's what we're doing. Nephew. 
Yes. That's Colin. what we're doing. That's yeah, we have doing. started. We need to we need to learn to work together to open doors for each other to propel some of these messages to different corners to share them. I don't know. Actually, I, need, I wanted to ask: uh, Can I find this message on YouTube? Yes, we'll send it to you. Yes. Okay, that is beautiful. I will send you the link. Okay. Oh, thank thank you so much, uh, Arthur Joy. I, I listen to Professor Karen Hunter every week. I listen to narrative. If I don't catch it on Saturday, because a lot of times I'm working, I catch it through the week, either Sunday afternoon or Monday when I'm doing my chores on my off day Monday. And I love, okay. love, love. Dr. Carr is so, so serious. We'll send you their information too, uh, okay. Brother Simon, so that you can be in touch with them. They are both professors and they love our community. They have a huge following. And Dr. Carr actually takes trips to uh, Kemet. He just got back from Kemet. And uh, our partner, Dr. Zita Seshi, uh, is in Canada. She's a PhD in sociology. And we were going to Ghana to her homeland this past December, December a year ago, but her father passed away about three weeks before we were going. So we have that trip scheduled to come up again next year. And the next time you come into the States, we want to take you to some of our places. Like on the 17th of November, I'm going with my historically black college. We're going on a luxury bus tour to Tulsa, Oklahoma. I have actually been to Tulsa several times, but I'm going with other people because you can never see it too much. That's where in the height of the Spanish flu, when everybody was dropping dead, the people certainly find enough energy to do racial trauma and they burned down these thriving black towns. So there's a museum there. We're going to leave Dallas at about 4 a.m. We'll get to Tulsa, Oklahoma at about eight and we'll spend the day there. There are also uh, towns that they're called sundown towns. You had to get out of that town before dark or something terrible would happen to you. The- I look forward to knowing all that. And I, I need all yes, that information. We, Yep. You, you, you do. You've, you've got to go to Tulsa and you've got to go to these towns where they actually, let's say they got 50 or 60 fire trucks and hose the town down, thriving black communities with businesses. And they're now lakes, whole towns that are underwater. And I asked Latanya all the time, I said, how, who can do that? And her answer is always a monster. But how many fire trucks do you have to take to drown a whole town? Lake Lanier just That's north terrible. of Atlanta was a thriving black community. And these towns many times are down in a low lying area and they just get up at the top of a mountain and just flood them with water. And then the town is no more. So this is the America that all of our brothers and sisters run to get to, to earn money, to get an education. But those of us who are Africans born in America, this is our reality. This is what we've been dealing with. And yes, we've we've made some strides. We're, we're not on, grateful for that. But I tell you, we did all this on the backs of our grandparents and great grandparents who suffered in the cotton fields 12 hours a day in 108 degree Fahrenheit weather. 36, you know, 37 in, degrees. You know, the, so. you know, there are so many people will tell you, yes, things have changed. Uh, others will say, you know, things are better. But let me tell you, in the race, of greatness, we don't compare with those that are that we've left behind. We compare ourselves to those that are far from us. The moment you, the moment someone tries to make you compare yourself with how far you have moved, then they're denying you a chance to see how far you had to go. You know, That's so true. don't focus on how far you have come. Focus on how far you could There's have so been if this had not existed. Yeah. That's, that's right. That's right. So as I said, we are about solutions, but I, I stand with Malcolm X firm when he says, you must know your history. And I search feverishly and for at least 40 years have documented and bought the books. In my downsizing right now, I, I still have a book habit. And I still buy lots of books because that, that knowledge and that information must be passed on. Well, we certainly thank you for coming. I'll give everybody like one more round robin. And if everyone wants to make 
a final point. This is a pop-up show. We normally are not here on Mondays and we wanted to keep to about an hour. So I will decrease and let you two have some final words. In the end, it's not the years that count in your life, but the life in your years. No one will be interested to know how long we lived. No one will want to know what we're able to eat, where we lived, how we put on. All people ask themselves, in your time, what were you able to achieve? What did you do that made those that came after you better? So our focus should never be on uh, satisfying ourselves with the pleasures of life, but laying a foundation for those yet to come. We know the opportunities that are here today for us to influence the trend of events in our continents, in our countries, in our communities, might not be there 100 years from today. Meaning we that are living today, we that are existing today, have been blessed with an opportunity to fight so hard, to stand once again, to join hands and build a foundation that will enable our great, great grandchildren live a better life. So I urge all those watching from all shores, from all corners of the world, that do not focus so much on how far you have come. Always focus on how far you could have been if these circumstances were not there. But remember, our time here on earth is not so much. It is very limited. But in that time, always ask yourself, what have you done today? What did you do yesterday? What are you, what, what are you going to do tomorrow to make this place better? for those that will come after us, for the opportunities that we are blessed with in our generation might not be there in their times. We have a solemn obligation today and now to do what we have to do, if they are to be what we want them to be tomorrow. Thank you so much. Powerful, powerful. Thank you, Brother Simon. I just want to say, if you haven't been inspired tonight, I'm not sure what is wrong with you. Um, and Brother Simon reminds us, no matter who you are, we've been marginalized people, but it's no excuse not to move. It's no excuse not to get up from where you are and see that you have hope in front of you. Tonight was the no excuses kind of night. Your yeah. homework is to move. Your homework is to be. Your homework is to find your purpose. It's in your passion is embedded in that purpose, Brother Simon taught us. So it's not hard to find. Your passion and your purpose are wedged together. That thing that God has been pulling on you to do and you've been worried about, I don't have the money, the friends, the clout. Stop worrying about all that. It's time to move. Each mm -hmm. one of us um, have different journeys that we've been on. I've learned so much tonight. I hope that you have gleaned something from tonight, we're going to be seeing more of Brother Simon. I need you to tell us before we let you go, Brother Simon, how do we find you? What are your social media outlets? Do you have a foundation? Can you let the people know how they connect with you? You can connect with us first and foremost through uh, Dr. Dana. She right, uh, she's right behind us. You can also find us on all social media platforms in the names of Simon Senkai Foundation. Simon Senkai Foundation. All media platforms on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. Uh, we are continuing to, uh, to do community outreaches in our people. Right now we have opened up beyond our shores to reach so many others outside our borders to, to, because for we are one. So we are moving out to build a strong family. So we are everywhere, Simon Senkai Foundation. Uh, for my, uh, for our uh, emails, Dr. Dana, Dr. Dana, you can contact uh, her, she has them. For our uh, more contacts, all our contacts actually, Dr. Dana, uh, we want Dr. Dana to be our ambassador in the yeah. United States. We want her to be our ambassador. That's, so if you need us, if you need right. to reach us, please go through Dr. Dana. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. We'll make sure that we share all of your information with everyone. And I did say, I, I tell all of our brothers and sisters, whether they're from Canada, wherever you are in the corners of the earth, if you are one of the sons or daughters of Africa, I tell them, find yourself a partner in the States, get your branch of your company developed in the States so that we can all benefit from the services that you're, you're offering. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're, uh, you're welcome. Thank you too. Wish yes, you all the best days. blessings. I'm online. I'm ready. I'm ready to roll. I'm ready to rock. Yes. Well, we'll discuss sometimes. We do keep up with current events. Every Thursday, it's a, an amazing show. And you have a great idea that we can pre-tape some and get you involved. Next, the next time we come together, I want you to talk lightly about allies and enemies and in times of war, what um, the sons and daughters of Africa need to be doing. Yeah. So for next time, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, LHG. You do just a splendid job of handling the engineering. And I tell you, this has been a great night. Much love to you all. Thanks for tuning in to Lemons to Lemonade. Good night. Good night. Good night, Good night everyone.